Introduction. 2010 marked a time of change in my life. For the better part of 12 years, I had endured back pain, and for 10 of those years I was based in the United Kingdom, where I worked a desk job by day and pursued music at night. This combination of slouching and then lugging guitars around took its toll, culminating in back pain that could not be ignored. You could see the strain in my face. Signs of age were creeping in. I looked older than many did my age. Looking side on in the mirror, I could see that my spine was curving into a hunch. This ached when I tried to straighten up. My lifestyle was exacting a heavy price. One day I decided to walk away from it all. Determined to change, I returned to my native home, New Zealand. There I began an explorative journey back to physical health, earning a degree in health science. Simultaneously, I apprenticed as a Tui Na practitioner and deep tissue therapist. I was taken under the wing of a generous oriental medicine doctor and trained in traditional methods of eastern healing not often seen in schools. There was a strong spiritual energy running through what I learned and it was here that I experienced a great truth. In serving the needs of others, your own needs will be fulfilled. This principle comes from the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. I cannot emphasize highly enough the truth of this teaching. The more work I did to help others overcome their pain, the less pain I realized I was experiencing. My pain was fading away. During this time, I explored yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, and Qigong, each of which unfolds deep healing potential. When combined together, these helped me revolutionize my spinal health. I was getting better. And, as friends who I hadn't seen for a while remarked with surprise, I was also getting taller. My hunch had disappeared. In its place, I stood nearly an inch taller. It may not seem like much, but to those who'd been looking me eye to eye for much of my life, it was noticeable. The practice that may have helped me the most was meditation. Sitting cross-legged on the floor for periods of time gave opportunity to consciously observe my back, how it interacted with my core muscles as I breathed in and out, and how activating certain core muscles while breathing massaged my sinews from within. This was a revelation. From such learning and experiences came a healing system aimed directly at alleviating back pain. This borrows from a wide range of traditions and is inspired by insights gained through helping others in the clinical setting. This knowledge took over 10 years to assemble and features the practices that, in my opinion, most effectively target the spine. These practices open up tightly closed muscular spaces promote the free flow of circulation, and relax, strengthen, and realign the spine. If you're living with back pain, either as a consequence of your job or due to illness or injury, undertake this work daily. These methods hold the potential to ease pain and improve mobility. In short, for those prepared to do the work, this course offers a way beyond back pain. The 80-20 rule, which holds that 80% of what we achieve is derived from 20% of our actions, is well applied when it comes to physical wellness. The world of healing and health education is fast. It took years to research firsthand all of the practices that inspired this program. Each of the traditions is focused on whole body health, often encompassing a spiritual dimension. I always approach these healing systems with an agenda, that being to hone in on those techniques which specifically targeted the spine and reduced back pain. My aim was to extract from these traditions the most effective techniques for remedying the pain I experienced. With confidence, what follows are those techniques, the methods that produced 80% of my results, yet which represent only 20% of my efforts. Considering the degree of learning involved, it may be more like a 90-10 rule. If years ago someone had handed me this book, I think I would have achieved freedom from back pain within two months or less. I'm glad of the journey I took, however. Sometimes the long way is best. My body took me on a journey of learning that I am grateful for. Medical Matters Let's get the disclaimer done. Although a qualified and registered health professional dedicated to the treatment of back pain, I'm not a medical doctor. Nothing written here is medical advice. Consult your physician when introducing new practices into your lifestyle. If you've had spinal surgery or a serious back injury in the past, run this program by your physician. 
These techniques gently promote blood flow into the spine, nerves and brain. Ramping up your circulation in all these areas is a helpful thing. However, an increase of blood flow to certain areas may be something your doctor might want to know about. Back pain caused by toxicity in the body. This is a good place to address back pain caused by high levels of toxins in the body. I love a good cup of coffee, but too much caffeine in the system will give me an ache in the lower back. This is because my kidneys, located deep to the lumbar spine, are being put under pressure to cleanse my blood of this toxin. The same goes for alcohol, which I happily enjoy in moderate amounts, but if overconsumed, will result in back pain for the same reason. A diet full of glucose and processed foods can also have effects of this nature, forcing the body to work harder to restore optimal chemical balance. Toxins in the bloodstream can be a cause of lower back pain. I advise moderation as a way of protecting your back and the bodily systems that support it. A change made here could be half the battle won. Give yourself every advantage. Our muscles love water. When hydration is insufficient, muscular health is weakened and pain will more likely be experienced. So be sure to integrate good water drinking habits into your lifestyle. Pain and physical sensation. Throughout this healing process, listen to your body. When starting out with the routines that follow, you may experience aches and sensations as your body begins to reshape itself. It's not unusual to hear the odd click when undertaking this sort of work. These are often just internal gases dispersing or tissue fibres interacting with each other, not something to be scared of. A physio once described me as the clickiest guy he had ever worked with, so don't be put off by strange bodily sounds. Focus more on pain signals. A manageable dull ache is generally associated with constructive growth, the stretching and strengthening of fibres. However, a sharp or electrical pain is a sign to cease what you're doing. If this happens, move on to the next activity. Give it a week, then try it again. If such pains continue, leave that particular practice alone. Press on with what you can do. This will keep you moving in a healthy direction. A few myths I've encountered. Let's discuss some mental myths that can hold a person back from achieving freedom from back pain. If any of these sound familiar, see if you can move beyond such ways of thinking. I'm too far gone to help. I hear this mentioned from time to time. Much of the time such beliefs are untrue. They also represent one of the main obstacles a person might encounter on the road to recovery. In my experience, there are very few spines that won't be helped when one regains blood flow to areas that were formerly locked up or that receive greater assistance from supporting muscles that were previously weak or dormant. While the extent of healing outcomes will always vary, many people are pleasantly surprised with the degree of recovery they make. Occasionally you can see that a structural problem exists, which does represent a major challenge to regaining health. One example is the advanced kyphotic curvature sometimes evident amongst the elderly. Here the curve of the spine is very pronounced, making it difficult to undertake physical activities. If someone presents this way, the healing approach remains the same. Improve blood flow to tight closed off spaces, engage all additional available muscular support, and train them in medicinal breath work, which we are about to explore. In my practice, I've seen many elderly clients reinvigorate their lives. It's arthritis. Not much you can do. The number of times I hear this is concerning. There is a tendency in the West towards thinking that arthritis is the cause of one's back pain. People sometimes think that because their pain feels close to the spine, that it is a spinal issue. However, the pain more often relates to the muscles and ligaments that support the spine. When these supportive tissues get tight, it may feel like pain of the spine, yet the issue is a muscular one. And with the right series of motions, strengthening, and lifestyle adjustments, these muscles can become pain-free and healthy again. Sometimes the cause of pain is arthritis. An x-ray may show small white growths on the side of the vertebrae that can irritate nerves and cause sharp pain. Whilst we have to work gently when this is the case, the treatment remains the same. Open what is closed, loosen what is tight, move what is stuck. My attitude towards treating bone is not that different to treating muscle. Soft tissue cells require oxygen and glucose to function. 
Likewise, heart tissue cells require oxygen and glucose to function. Where either becomes dysfunctional, I expect to see some form of obstruction to the free flow of blood. When freedom of flow is restored, I normally see an improvement in the activity of cells there, leading to reduced pain and increased function. In many parts of the body, blood must travel through and around the muscle in order to get to bone. Tight muscles can therefore have a detrimental effect on the very bone supporting them. If you can improve the flow of blood to arthritic bones, you can help them. It's just part of getting old. Yes and no. It may be true that a person is not recovering from injury at the rate they were when they were younger, but you simply cannot attribute all health disorders to age. Consider such inspirational characters as Ernestine Shepherd, who won her first bodybuilding competition at age 71, and who now, in her mid-80s, continues to awe and inspire people globally with her strength. Or Yuichiro Miura, who, at 80 years of age, became the oldest person ever to climb the summit of Mount Everest. This is all the more remarkable, as in his late 60s, he had been in poor health and had required two heart operations to survive. At that time in his life, no one, including himself, could ever have imagined what his mind and body were still capable of. And while these two figures are clearly outliers in their age groups, thousands of people every day are waking up to this fact. Chronological age need not define who you are or what you are capable of. Move beyond meaningless numbers when viewing your age. Find out what your biological age is instead. Find a good physiotherapist who can measure this for you. The beauty of using biological age markers is that you can then reverse your age through exercise and healthy choices. The damage is permanent. A serious injury can seem permanent. Some injuries are stubborn and slow to recover. They cause pain, often require medication, and can leave one feeling despondent and frustrated. While some injuries may never heal to the extent one feels as good as new, in the majority of cases I've seen, efforts to improve one's situation are rewarded. Motivation can be found in the examples of those who have recovered from injury to achieve great things. One such example is that of Dr. Joe Dispenza, who, as a young man, suffered multiple fractures to his spine and was told he'd never walk again. Dr. Joe, as he's widely known, applied himself determinedly, mind, body and soul, to regaining his health. Nine weeks later, he was walking unassisted. To this day, he teaches thousands of people globally about the healing power of mind. If he could do that, you can do this. Recovery from serious injury is possible because of neuroplasticity, the way the nerves of our body can change and adapt. This is a process largely influenced by the mind. So know this, with the right attitude, spinal function can be restored and pain reduced. Change your mind, so your mind can inspire change within your body. Mind, motion and breath. This course represents the most effective elements for relieving back pain and restoring spinal health that I have encountered as both a patient and practitioner. All of these elements present a unique and effective system aimed at helping you reduce your pain by moving blood into places it cannot currently get to. Where blood flows freely, pain is alleviated and function improves. This training gets deep into the fibres, utilising the interior mechanics of the core, diaphragm and spine. It introduces the concepts of open and flow and the mind-body connection. This forms a unique synthesis of motion, muscular function, breath work and mind. Believe me when I say you're going to be working at depths beyond what can be achieved by external therapy. What's more, you'll be working under your own steam every day. A space in which to grow. Before going further, let's get your environment set up. You'll need a flat space on which to lie comfortably, at least a foot away from anything else in all directions. A yoga mat is highly recommended for lying on, although if you have a nice soft carpet, that's fine too. I also recommend having a cushion to support your neck. Further to that, a flat open outdoor space will be required for some activities. If this proves impractical, a space indoors will be okay, as long as you can move relatively freely without fear of knocking something over or stepping on anything, such as a curious pet, roller skate, small piece of Lego, etc. 
If you've got a nice smooth lawn, you can practice barefoot, which will offer a range of postural benefits according to recent studies in orthopaedics. However, if your garden is a little more tangled and wild, such as mine is, please ensure you wear the appropriate footwear for such conditions. I also recommend that the room is a comfortable temperature and not too chilly. Muscles behave better in warm conditions. Likewise, if the weather outside isn't great, dress appropriately. Outdoor work is wonderful in that it fills the lungs with fresh air and allows sunlight on the skin. However, avoid days that are extra cold, wet and windy. Become hip-centred. Throughout many of these activities, you'll be asked to raise your pelvic floor and engage your core muscles. An easy trick to employ when raising the pelvic floor is to bring the tip of the tailbone forward with a flex of the glutes. Many people walk around with their backs extended and pelvic floor slanted diagonally forward. This is the biological equivalent of a bowl that has been overturned on its side with half its contents scattered. Having the pelvic floor tipping forward offers the back very little stability. Imagine trying to cook dinner in a diagonally slanted kitchen. You could do it, but it wouldn't be easy. To even out the space that supports your spine, tuck your tailbone forward with a gentle flex in the glutes to get that pelvic floor horizontal, and once it is there, keep it there. If you've ever practiced the approach of mindfulness, keeping your pelvic floor horizontal is a bit like that. Just as a mindfulness practitioner checks in with their mind and emotions regularly, you can check in with your hips and pelvis in much the same way. What a difference this will make for the bones and muscles of your hips and spine. With a firm flat platform beneath them, their function will improve. This step alone will likely bring a noticeable change to the way you feel. Check in with your pelvis and tailbone often. Do this not only for the duration of this course, but for the rest of your life. This ebook features 12 key exercises, the best of the best in my opinion. Through combining these different motions, stretches and strengthening activities, you will be addressing a wide range of problems, including over-exaggerated curvatures, postural tension, pinched nerves, inflammation, core weakness, misalignment, and most prominently, a lack of free-flowing blood. It is my view that where you succeed in opening closed muscular spaces and restoring blood flow, you will achieve freedom from pain. A commitment to this course of 27 minutes a day, split across mornings and evenings, for one month will get you a large part of the way there. That might sound like a lot of time, but trust me, with the right music playing, that time flies by. Once you have committed yourself to this program, expect notable changes within a single month. These results will propel you further into this work with greater motivation. I'm willing to bet this, when you do the work, as many have discovered, you will encounter less and less pain. And if you continue with this program for beyond a month, the sky is the limit in terms of the strength, freedom, and mobility you can regain. Okay, let's do this. The 12 techniques that will help you free your spine. Step one, medicinal breathing. Let's ensure that the way you breathe supports and assists your spine. A great many people I meet with back pain do not breathe optimally. I can often trace a portion of their pain to this fact. People in this category tend to breathe shallow quick breaths their chests tend to rise and fall quickly, which can tighten the pectoral muscles and place the upper back under strain. Medicinal breathing is a three-part process involving breath work, mental focus, and core engagement. Ensure that your inhalations are filling the space below the chest, the mid and lower abdomen, so that as you inhale air, the belly feels like an expanding balloon with the chest nice and relaxed. Now, as the belly expands like a balloon, Feel and imagine all those closed and tight spaces of your body opening right up. And then, as you gently breathe out, sense your body's energy flowing through those open spaces. Open on the in-breath and flow with the out-breath. Hence, I call this part of the process open and flow. Where the mind goes, energy follows. The second stage of our medicinal breathing is to engage the mind's conscious power. Over a hundred years ago, physicists discovered that the act of observing matter changed matter. This is because consciousness is energy. When we place our conscious energy on any part of our body, we bring a certain type of energy to that part of our body. 
the quality of the energy we bring to our body is determined by awareness and emotion. In the clinic, I sometimes hear off-handed remarks like My back is killing me! Or I'm pissed off with my shoulder. When I hear such things, I sense an opportunity to change the quality of the conscious energy a person is feeding that part of themselves. Resentment and annoyance are the sorts of emotion that will not help any aspects of one's body. What will help the body is the presence of coherent conscious energy, focused on wherever discomfort is felt. This idea is most prevalent in the Vipassana meditation tradition. Practitioners of this meditation will sit for hours, days, or even months in absolute silence. Whenever physical pain arises, they are taught to simply witness and acknowledge this pain. From the accounts I have collected from the practitioners of this discipline, pain seems to melt away in the presence of coherent conscious attention. Under less intensive conditions, I have experienced this for myself. Where conscious focus is placed, conscious energy builds. And if that energy is coherent, this will benefit the body and alleviate pain. Three powerful emotions for creating coherent consciousness are acceptance, appreciation, and gratitude. These bring peace to the mind, which then brings peace to the body. So I ask people to listen deeply to their bodies with a sense of acceptance and appreciation. Even as they may be experiencing discomfort in listening to, accepting and appreciating your back, you'll bring a coherent energy to it. This energy can elicit healing at more profound levels than is commonly understood in Western medical science. In saying that, much evidence exists in support of how the conscious mind can influence the body. In listening to, accepting and appreciating your back, you will bring a coherent energy to it. As you breathe, wherever you feel pain, allow your mind to rest there. Imagine as you breathe that you are breathing oxygen into that part of your body. Then, one, listen deeply to what you feel. Two, accept what you feel. And three, express appreciation for this part of your body. Silently thank all of the cells from which the body is formed and go one step further. Thank the living energy that powers those cells. The last phase of medicinal breathing involves core engagement, but first I want to provide some extra background into how I discovered this method. Early on in my personal healing journey, I began to meditate in the lotus posture. Normally about 10 minutes into such activities, an aching burn would creep into my mid-back muscles. This pain would increase until I was forced to make a postural adjustment. Aware as I was of the concept, where the mind goes, energy follows, these meditations generally involved me sitting and observing my back pain. Breathing into the core. Some way into these meditative processes, I made a discovery. This involved breathing deeply while clenching my abdominal wall glutes, lumbar and pelvic floor, as though flexing every muscle in my lower abdomen at once. When doing this, I noticed how the muscles of my core and spine were inwardly squashed by my diaphragm. Lungs expanding, my diaphragm hugged these muscles, squeezing and pushing into them. As I exhaled, the internal pressure on these muscles released. I then noticed a subtle shift in my centre of gravity. I did this again and again noticing that my back pain was starting to dissipate. I realized that each breath was inspiring gentle motions within my muscles. With motion came blood flow, and with blood flow came the oxygen my spinal muscles were crying out for. A realization came to me. Previously, while sitting static and extended for long periods, the muscles that kept me straight and upright had tightened under constant strain. This meant that the blood could not travel so easily to the deeper muscular fibres. However, the act of strongly engaging my core muscles whilst breathing seemed to change this. With each breath came motion, as the diaphragm pushed into the core, this squeezed my spinal muscles, as though massaging them from within. Such internal motions enabled blood to travel more freely between fibres. As this happened, that dull constant ache would ease right off. A subtle shift in gravity was taking place as I inhaled and exhaled. 
my body weight was shifting across different muscular fibers. With more fibers sharing the burden, as well as improved circulation, I became able to sit for long periods. I realized that breathing into the core could also be done when standing in queues, sitting through lectures, and even when walking. It became one of my favorite things to do. I noticed my back become stronger after this. I became able to sit for long durations with significantly less back pain. Perhaps this is what Vipassana meditators and Zen monks do. It seemed my core muscles were working more effectively with my spine. I no longer needed to lean back into chairs for support. I was so happy with this outcome that I started sitting straight backed when relaxing or even out socializing. At some point, strong upright sitting must have become an unconscious habit. I realized this when out having dinner with friends. They were giggling at the way I was sitting and gently making fun of me. One of them actually asked if I could sit there straight. I think I was embarrassing them. <laughs> I had to chuckle. After all that postural improvement, I now had to consciously train myself to slouch again when out in public. Sitting straight may be great for your health, but it doesn't do much for your social life. I share this story because of the benefit I received when uniting muscles and breathing this way. It was a leap forward in my personal health. You might also experience such a leap. So let's undertake the third and final phase of medicinal breathing. Engaging the core. 1. Sit somewhere unsupported. This could be either on a bench or cross-legged on the floor. Ensure you are stable. Imagine that the very top of your head is being suspended by an invisible thread so that your spine is elongated. Maintaining an upright spine, relax your muscles. 2. Breathe in for 4 seconds, allowing air to deeply fill the lungs, your belly expanding like a big balloon. The diaphragm will squeeze itself downward as air rushes in, pressing gently against your core muscles as it does. 3. Breathe out for 4 seconds. As you exhale, raise the pelvic floor so it squeezes upwards towards the base of the spine to introduce a push from below. This action stimulates blood flow around the hip and spinal muscles. 4. Now, maintaining that raised pelvic floor, breathe in for 4 seconds, belly expanding like a balloon. Then, when it's time to breathe out, clench all the core muscles of the lower abdomen so they press around the lower spine from all sides as if giving it a strong hug. Feel the abdominal wall, pelvic floor, hip and glute muscles all squeezing in around the lower spine. 5. Maintain this strong clench as you breathe in again for 4 seconds. Breathe into all these strongly flexed muscles and feel how they interact with the spine as the diaphragm presses down against the mole. This further stimulates the flow of blood into different areas of the back. As you breathe out for four, release the clench, allowing all tension to ease. Breathe out in a relaxed fashion. You may feel a surge of blood moving through the lower abdomen. Six. Now, breathe in naturally for four and out naturally for four. Observe the sensations that arise. Repeat the whole exercise, then breathe again. Cultivate an awareness of how certain breath cycles interact with specific muscles in their various states of tension and rest. Explore this. Can you feel enhanced blood flow? What about the shifting tilt of your centre of gravity? These dynamic activities both disperse pressure and improve circulation. Sit and breathe like this for a span that feels right to you. A minimum spell of 3 minutes is recommended, but feel free to practice this for longer if you have the time. Also, look for the opportunities to generate this practice into your regular lifestyle, especially at work. And if at any stage you feel more discomfort than a dull ache, ease back into your regular way of sitting. And that is medicinal breathing. If you practice core drilling exercises like yoga or pilates, you'll find sitting like this effortless. If you're a desk worker, this may pose more of a challenge, but your health will benefit. Put it to the test, and, if you haven't already, why not take up meditation while you're at it? Medicinal breathing in daily life. Deep abdominal breathing benefits your lower back by producing motion that stimulates blood flow. So breathe deeply often, ensuring the belly expands like a balloon as you do, 
It's important that the belly rises when inhaling, as this means the diaphragm is more actively engaged. Once again, when breathing out, squeeze those core muscles inwards, drawing up the pelvic floor and emptying the lungs of air. In addition to oxygenating the body, this style of breathing massages the sinews from within. You can breathe this way while sitting, walking, running or lying flat on your back, which we'll explore further. Breathe, appreciate and be. Step 2. Flat back, knees up. Lie flat on your back for a few moments. Then raise your knees upwards while keeping your feet on the ground. So both rows of ankle, knee and hip joints form an even triangle. With your head supported by a smallish cushion, your neck should rest neutrally, neither flexed forward or extended backwards. Hands should rest at the sides. This is a deeply transformative position. It gently aligns the spinal vertebrae while releasing tension from upright postural muscles. While in this position, ensure the belly rises with the in-breath and falls on the out-breath, as with medicinal breathing. As you breathe, the diaphragm will gently push the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae against the flat, firm surface beneath you, like a gentle adjustment. For this reason, a firm but not hard surface beneath you would be ideal. Practice this simple but effective posture for 15 minutes daily, best done in the afternoon or evening after your day's exertions. What happens during that 15 minutes is a gentle decompressing of the vertebrae of the spine. This allows more space to emerge between each set of the vertebrae, easing pressure from the spine, promoting freedom of blood flow and allowing muscles to better relax. Regular practice of this technique is deeply transformative. Step 3. Lateral supine twists. After lying in the flat back knees up posture for 15 minutes, tilt the knees and hips to the left to feel a good stretch in the lumbar region. While in this stretch, take four deep belly breaths, then swivel hips and knees in the opposite direction, taking four breaths on that side. Repeat two more times. If your pain is centered more in the upper thoracic and neck region, when folding hips and legs to one side, also stretch your arms out towards the wall behind the top of your head. While doing this, turn your neck in the direction opposite to the direction your knees are pointed in. Stretch and breathe deeply. Feel blood entering the spaces between those upper vertebrae and fibers. Release this stretch when you bring your hips back to the center and bring your neck back to neutral. Step four, the half bridge. From the flat back knees up position, push your pelvis forwards and upwards so that your spine forms a straight line at around 30 degrees of angle. Hold this position for four belly breaths and then relax. Let the pelvis go and allow your back to become flat again on the floor. Rest for a few moments. Repeat this action five times. This strong stretch lengthens the spine while strengthening back, pelvis and abdominal wall. Step 5. Sideways rock with the scrunchy variation. From flat back knees up, bend and raise your knees to your chest. Place the respective sided hand over each knee and gently hug your legs into your torso. Rock to your left and then to your right. Feel how doing this presses on and massages the long muscular sinews of the back. Do this for a minute and then slow your rocking motions down. Gently rock to your right and then come to a halt. The pressure of your arms over your knees should press down on your right side back muscles. Get a sense for anywhere on the right side of the back that is holding tension. Breathe deeply into this sensation for a total of four breaths. The scrunchy variation. Add a variation to the sideways rock by screwing up a large piece of paper into a ball about the size of your fist. If you have a particular area where tension and pain are prominent on either side of your spine, slip this paper ball underneath your back, avoiding the vertebra in the center, and gently rock your weight onto it. Make adjustments until you feel a deep ache, indicating where tension rests and where it can be relieved. Hold your weight on that key position and breathe open and flow breaths. You will soon feel that ache begin to dissipate, and as it does, 
the tension will loosen. When the ache is released, move the ball a range of widths across the back while rocking at various different lengths along the spine. This will generally loosen the muscles in that area. These activities will give rise to the bodily sensations of life. Having completed this routine, rest and immerse your awareness within these sensations. Step 6. Cat Camel I've worked alongside physios for nearly a decade. One thing many of them agree on is this. When it comes to alleviating back pain, you won't find many techniques better than the Cat Camel. Like many of these activities, this exercise is rooted in Eastern traditions spanning thousands of years. As simple as it is, the Cat Camel gets right into the spinal muscles, taking the entire length of the spine through its two core motions extension and flexion. To start, climb onto your hands and knees. Ensure that your hands are under your shoulders, your knees are under your hips, and that your back is neutral. Now, sink your back towards the floor while lifting your head upwards at the same time, sticking your tailbone out to make an extended curve with the spine. Take a big breath. You may feel a stretch along the length of the spine. Part 2. Let out your breath. Tuck your head and tailbone inwards, arching them towards each other. This will arch your spine up in the manner of a camel hump. Take in another big breath. Repeat 10 times. Should any pain other than a dull ache arise before you hit that number, ease off and relax. Step 6. Cat Child From the all fours position, shift your weight back onto your hips so your buttocks rest on your calves and heels. Then, inch your hands further forward until you feel a comfortable stretch all the way from the hips, up the spine, and into the neck and shoulders. This position is the perfect time to integrate the open and flow medicinal breathing technique. Holding this stretch, breathe deeply into your belly, open, and then exhale, flow. Take 11 good breaths. End this routine by folding yourself into the child's pose. This deeply relaxes the spine. Shift your buttocks back towards your calves while folding at the waist, resting your torso across the front of your thighs. Allow your forehead to rest on the ground beneath you. Let go of any tension in the spine and imagine you are sinking into the earth. From here, undertake open and flow medicinal breathing, belly expanding like a balloon, and then squeezing that balloon down to nothing. Sense where closed spaces are opening and where vital energy is flowing. Breathe, appreciate and be. Stay in this pose for a minute or so, then roll over onto your back again. Assuming the flat back knees up posture, lie there for as long as you choose to. Listen to the internal sensations that have arisen from these activities. Allow your muscles and mind to relax. You've earned this. Step 7. Spinal Correctives One of my yoga teachers was a woman in her mid-80s. A vibrant teacher with a no-nonsense style of communicating, she taught me a series of moves she called spinal correctives. Having studied yoga for 45 years, she had encountered these teachings decades earlier and swore of their efficacy for treating issues of the spine. I put them into practice and found that they got into the hips and lumbar in a different way to anything else I'd tried. They are performed lying on the front. Spinal corrective one. Lying flat on your front, turn your neck to the left so your right ear rests on the mat while moving your body into a straight lying pose on your front. Now, raise your right leg up behind you. Keep the leg straight and take four open and flow breaths. After this, gently lower the leg. Rest for a moment and feel what sensations arise in the hip and back regions. Repeat with both sides reversed. Spinal Corrective 2 Lift the right leg again, however this time feature a 90 degree right angle bend in the knee. Feel how this works deeply into the hips. Take four deep open and flow medicinal breaths, then lower the leg. Rest for a few moments before repeating on the opposite side. Spinal Corrective 3. This time, as you lift the right leg, keep it straight and push the right foot away from you, as though wanting to touch your soul to the wall behind you. 
Hold this strong push in the leg for a series of four deep breaths. Introduce a circling motion in the leg for another two breaths before lowering the leg and resting for a few moments. Repeat for the opposite side. Then rest, appreciate and breathe into the sensations that arise. Spinal Corrective 4 Lastly, find a large book between 1 to 1.5 inches in width. With legs straight, stand with one foot upon this book and the other flat on the floor. Breathing medicinally, stand this way for 10 breaths, then switch feet. This provides a deep stretch that may feel tingly afterwards. It's time to build strength. The exercises that follow provide effective ways to improve core stability while maintaining a supported spine. Step 8. Horizontal Core Building These are the core strengthening exercises that will strengthen the abdominal wall and supporting spinal fibres. When your wall is strong, your spine is better protected. Once strengthened and engaged, the core muscles involved with these exercises will quite naturally come to the support of your back when sitting, moving or lifting. Pedaling Lying flat on your back, start a slow forward pedaling motion with your feet raised about two feet in the air above you. Make sure the abdominal wall is engaged as you undertake large forward pedaling motions, as though pedaling a very large bicycle. Remember to breathe as you do this and undertake 20 pedaling motions with each foot. When you reach 20 motions, reverse the pedaling as though now pedaling backwards. This is a tricky thing to do as it's likely you've not had to pedal backwards before. It isn't something we do often. It'll probably be a new mechanical motion for your brain to compute and may feel clunky and unfamiliar at first. Just do your best to do 20 of these. Drawing circles. Now, we're going to engage the lateral core muscles. Feet and legs together, begin to draw large clockwise circles with the flat sole of your foot. The larger the radius of each circle you make, the greater effort your core has to produce. You'll feel the ache this time more laterally. The aim is to draw 20 large circles clockwise and then 20 anti-clockwise. Remember to breathe as you do this, syncopating breaths with sets of cycles. I like to breathe in for two cycles and breathe out for two. Rest in between forward and back circling sets and once completed, just lie there and feel the lively sensations of blood flow moving through the core. Well done. Step 9. Core walking. What's great about this next exercise is that, in addition to strengthening the torso, it trains you how to walk in a strong and supported way. Furthermore, this activity can be undertaken virtually anywhere, be it a walk to the kitchen or a walk in the park. Get into this daily and build your strength. This involves stepping from one spot to another with added core tension and lateral twisting, spine elongated. Stand in the direction you intend to walk in. Tuck your tailbone in, raise the pelvic floor and clench that core. Hold that tension and prepare for your first step. In slow motion, about a third of your normal walking speed, step forward with your right leg, raising it higher than usual so the thigh is brought close to 180 degrees. Simultaneously, bring your right knee diagonally inwards to the midline of the body. As you do this, twist your torso to the left. Then with a slight forward bend at the hips, move your left arm across the midline and bring it to rest on top of your right thigh. Left upper meets right lower. Allow the right leg to fall forward, foot making contact with the ground. And move the left arm back to the side, so the torso is upright and front facing again. Simultaneously, Breathe medicinally, stretching and squeezing the core and spinal sinews with the diaphragm. Now, keeping pelvic floor raised and core clenched, take a slow motion stride with the left leg. Raise it high, with the right arm crossing the midline to rest on the left thigh, with a slight bend at the hip and twist of the torso. An interior burn may already be starting to develop. Take a series of steps in this fashion now until you feel a strong burning ache in the core region. You will quickly feel warmth in the hip flexors, the leg raising muscles, that may tingle all the way up the abdominal wall and into the obliques at your sides. When this achy burn becomes intolerable, lower the raised leg, stand and breathe for a moment. There are a number of possible breathing rhythms for this technique. You might like to breathe in on the first step and out on the next, 
or take two full steps on a single large inhalation and two further steps on another large exhalation. Find which breath cycle works best for you. This strengthens a wide range of muscles and trains your body to walk in a strong, sturdy fashion. Practice through your day as opportunity allows. Step 10. The up, down. I had been practicing this exercise for years before I realized its true value. When done as a series of warm-up motions, you can sense its benefit. However, when conscious core work and medicinal breathing are incorporated, its transformative potential really becomes apparent. Heels touching, toes pointed away from each other at about 70 degrees. Stand straight, with tailbone tucked in and pelvic floor gently engaged. Imagine a silver thread suspending your head and reaching skywards, elongating the spine. Take a nice deep belly breath, fill the lower portion of those lungs. As you exhale, clench the core around the spine, pelvic floor pushing upwards. Core, abdominal wall, lumbar, hips and glutes all pushing inward. Really squeeze that diaphragm. Now hold that squeeze as you breathe in. As you inhale, push that diaphragm down deeply into those clenched muscles. Feel them all pushing into each other. Then slowly breathe out. Take one more cycle of breathing this way. Inhaling, pushing down on that clenched core and then breathing out one more time. Visualization work. As the hips and torso move downward, keep the spine elongated, as though an invisible pair of hands were holding your head up, despite the rest of you sinking downwards, so that even as your body relaxes into the earth, your spine remains straight. This visualization is helpful when it comes to maximizing the stretch, which you will now be feeling all along your spine. When I perform the up-down in my mornings before work starts, I'm often able to sense the deeply transformative potential of this exercise as my lower spine tingles away with energy afterwards. This gives me a real lift through my day and seems to create space and energy in and around the lower back and sacrum. Step 11. Rocking and Rolling In ancient Chinese practices such as Qigong and Tai Chi exists the concept of the lower Dantian, an energetic space occupying the area behind the navel and above the pubic bone. There are also two other Dantian. These are the upper Dantian, located in the head space, and the middle Dantian, located in the heart space. The seat of primordial power within the body, the lower Dantian inhabits the core region of our body, where it regulates the organs and builds energy. It seems to me that references to the lower Dantian relate at least in part to the kinetic power contained within the body's core. For the sake of mechanics, references to the lower Dantian, often simply called the Dantian, could in some ways be interpreted as references to the energy and action of the hips and core. Earlier in this book, I talked about how I trained in the therapy of Tuina, which, among many things, involved massaging and manipulating deep muscular fibers. I discovered that as I engaged in this style of work with clients that my back pain became less noticeable. After a full day of lectures and study, my back could ache intensely. However, after working with Tuina, sometimes for eight hours or more, I often felt barely any pain at all. What was going on here? One of my Tuina teachers was a highly qualified and experienced practitioner. A wise and spiritual person, one of the earliest lessons he taught me was that all power must come from the Dantian. When leaning an elbow into someone, the force and weight had to flow outward from the lower Dantian. When pushing muscles one way or plucking them another, the force exerted had to originate from the lower Dantian. This concept took some learning to grasp and become proficient in, but eventually, as I worked from my lower Dantian, I was able to flow through this physical work with minimal upper body tension, and so it was that my back pain began to ease off and then disappear completely. It wasn't as clear to me then as it is now, but when I was working physically with my energy and weight rooted in my lower Dantian, my work began to resemble an extended Tai Chi routine. While working on other people, I was rocking my weight back and forth whilst sinking my energy into my hips and core. 
This way of working might have been benefiting my own health more than it was benefiting the people I was treating. Talk about a win-win. With this in mind, the next few exercises capture the essence of those same motions, rooting the body's weight and energy within the Dantian while moving and breathing. I hope they help you as much as they've helped me. Rocking. Bend both knees, rotate forward at the hips and place your left hand on top of your left knee and place your right hand on top of your right thigh, thumb nestled into the inguinal crease of the groin. Lean your weight into your arms and hands. Raise pelvic floor and engage core. Shift your weight from side to side by wagging your tailbone 30 degrees to the right and then 30 degrees to the left. When your weight shifts to the right, the toes of your left foot should come up off the ground with the left heel pivoting to allow this, right foot firmly rooted to the ground. When your weight shifts to the left, your right foot's heel should raise off the ground, the right toes and firm ball of the foot pivoting to allow this, left foot firmly rooted to the ground. Rock your weight forward and back in this fashion for one or two minutes. At times, push into the left arm and straighten it slightly. At other times, push into the right arm and straighten that slightly. This combined with the hip actions will gently adjust and align the spine. You may hear small clicks and pops. Do this again with everything reversed, right to left, for another minute. Then, feet staying in position, bring your torso upright for the next phase of the routine. Rolling. This exercise is partnered with rocking. Keep your legs and feet exactly as they were for the previous exercise. Check that the pelvic floor is raised, core is engaged, and spine elongated. Then, with glute, hip, and leg muscles, shift your weight forward and then back, again, again, and again. Imagine the Dantian, the energy resting behind the belly button and above the pelvic floor, as a ball moving from your left side and back to your right side, assisted by the same motion of the feet as the previous exercise. Weight shifts left, right toes go up, weight shifts right, left heel goes up. Imagine the Dantian as a bowling ball, rolling one way and then the other. Introduced to this left right forward back roll, a circular motion with the arms. As your weight shifts forward, your hands follow a downward circular arc. As your weight shifts backwards, your hands, relaxed at the wrist, form the upper arc of the circular motion, forming one full circle for every back and forth. I found this to be profoundly beneficial to my wrists, hands and fingers, which I use to practice therapy, write books, edit videos, play guitar and drink cups of tea. This has become an extremely helpful method, one that I rely on and practice daily. When you've got the motion and rhythm sorted, squeeze that core. Every aspect, the back and forth sway and action of the arms, should connect with and be driven by the Dantian. Breathe deeply as you carry out these motions, and as you do, pay attention to the world around you. A personal note. For me, this activity has shifted beyond the purely mechanical and has become a mind, motion and breath meditation. When done outside in the fresh morning air, it fills my being with the lively living energy, chi, of the world around me. Step 12. Hip moves. Swiveling, tapping and rotating. This inspires blood flow into the base of the spine and into the hips, assisting hip joints and vertebrae. Swiveling. Take a standing stance with a slight bend in the knees, feet about level with hips, elongate the spine while sinking the body's weight into the legs. Reaching your arms behind you, place your open palms into the small of the back, the lower part which curves inwards, to provide lumbar support. Spine neutral, tilt forward at the hips to rotate torso gently forward. Reverse this action, keeping the spine neutral while tilting your torso backwards about 30 degrees, or as close to that as is comfortable. Breathe in on the forward tilt and out on the rear tilt. Repeat 10 times, then rest. Tapping. This involves gently thumping the lumbar muscles to stimulate blood flow and loosen tension in the posterior lower back. Stand with a slight bend in the knees, feet about level with hips. Elongate the spine while sinking the body's weight into the legs. Arms hanging loose at your side, introduce a side to side motion by turning the hips to twist at the waist. Twist to your left, then right, and then left again. 
your hands should thump into the lower back with each twist. Notice where the back of your left hand lands as you twist to your left. It may land with a percussive thump just above the right buttock. The right hand should land just above the left buttock when you twist right. With the gentlest guidance, direct the backs of each of these hands so they land a little higher, percussively massaging the lumbar muscles with each respective twist. Syncopate your twisting rhythms with your breathing. Keep this up for a minute or two, then come back to standing naturally again. Your lumbar spine should now be tingling with sensation. Rotating. Hands on hips. Imagine the tip of your tailbone is a magic marker pen. Stand with feet aligned with hips. Then draw 20 large clockwise circles with your tailbone. As the coccyx traverses in a 360 degree arc, you will feel this motion stretching and engaging almost every muscle and ligament that forms the hip system in some way. Even if a hip muscle doesn't directly engage or move in some way to support this motion, it will benefit indirectly from improved blood flow throughout the sacroiliac, pelvic, inguinal and lumbar regions. Furthermore, the knees, ankles and entire spine stand to benefit from this odd looking yet deeply engaging motion. And those are the 12 routines I recommend you put into daily practice. Commit to these and expect significant improvements within a single month. In the last pages of this book is a recommended set of daily activities to help you start this journey back towards pain-free living. This is the strategy that I would follow if I found myself experiencing back pain again. 